Uh, it's morning news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Now, uh, we're live uh, tonight on 3FM 92.7. So beginning today, Ghana Tonight is live on 3FM 92.7. For those of you who are on the go, we are responding to the calls that a number of you made. Um, as you're driving right now, you can tune in as well to 3FM 92.7. And we're live on right there on Ghana Tonight. Now, news just coming through. Right now, the Ministry of Health has disputed claims by residents of La that uh, the La General Hospital project has been halted. Well, we were there earlier today, but in, in a statement released by uh, the ministry just some few minutes ago, uh, the ministry is saying that the construction of the La General Hospital has not been halted. It says over the past few weeks, significant progress has been made. Uh, with various stages of construction expedited to ensure timely completion. There's a part of the statement quoting, understanding its importance to the community and the wider healthcare system. The ministry confirms that the contractor overseeing this project has recently submitted a certificate for payment as part of standard operational procedures. This certificate is currently uh, being processed by the ministry. But you know what? After this Ministry of Health statement, I want to take you back. My colleague, Sarah Pencro was there earlier today. And there's a reason why the residents say that the project has stalled, because they don't see any activity happening there. And bear in mind as well that there was a timeline that was given for the completion of the outpatient department, OPD, for this La General Hospital. That's October, end of October. Today is the 28th, right? The residents are within their right to want to raise questions about what is happening with this project and the promise of that timeline of end of October for the OPD to be ready. So take a look at this, what we found out earlier today. The reconstruction of the La General Hospital has lingered since 2020 when President Kufu Addo cut sword for the reconstruction project to commence. After three years, Construction work began a few months ago with an October-November deadline for the OPD services to be completed and open to residents of La. This is the state of the project site when we visited on Monday afternoon. The seventh floor staff accommodation unit is almost completed while the main hospital structure is on the ground floor. Information guarded by TV3 suggests that the contractor has run out of funds, forcing the workers to vacate the site for about a week now. The workers, we are told, have all left the site since the work stalled. A former administrator at the La General Hospital, Chris Anan, expressed disappointment at the pace of work. Every project, before you start, you have funds made available. You don't just start and then halfway through you see the money is finished, which was uh, totally a mistake on part of government. They started building flats for doctors. Without hospital, what are doctors coming to do over here? So far as I'm concerned, uh, nothing is going on here. Residents who have been eager to see the project completed, at least before the December 7 elections, say their hopes have been dashed. From past this seven months and they are working, but recently, I learned that they're not working again. Why? Because the money is finished. The government is not paying them. But recently, someone died because of heart attack. What is it? I don't know what it is. Someone died just over here. If the hospital is, is, is there, at least the person might be survived. 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 At least the person they were working and we were excited. Now nothing is happening and they are not saying anything tangible. Well, so that's the verdict of the residents. The, the woman you heard speaking right there says she sells just across the road. So if there's activity there, they see it, they know it. When the contractors are on site, they are the ones who are there to pass a verdict on their presence. For the past a little over a week, there's nothing happening there. And bear in mind as well that there was a timeline of end of October for this outpatient department of this La General Hospital, uh, which has been reconstructed after it was demolished, to be completed. So 
if that timeline is in mind and we go there, we ascertain the fact that based on the current state of affairs at that site, this timeline certainly may not be, be achieved two days away. And you saw those structures there. So we will go there again at the end of October to ascertain whether that promise of the OPD being uh, completed by end of October has been achieved. But this is what the ministry is saying, as against the verdict of the people, the residents who live in the area. But coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, round 10 of the Afrobarometer survey report makes stark revelations um, about some institutions and how the public perceives them. Um, let me take you th into the details and we're going to break it down one step and one after the other every step of the way so we don't clump everything together. Well, we're starting off with the focus on the first, first five of top perceived corrupt institutions in this country. And we're going to take you on a journey and I want you to follow me closely because this Afrobarometer round 10 follows up from what the Afrobarometer round 9 survey also um, put out. Now, this round 10 survey puts out a very rather worrying picture for the institutions perceived to be corrupt. Take a look at this. In the round 9 survey, between 19, which was conducted between 2019 and 2022, the police came tops at the most perceived corrupt institution in this country. 65% of the respondents said that the police was most corrupt, followed by the Office of the Presidency. 55% of the respondents said they were most corrupt. And some of the respondents said, yes, the Office of the President was corrupt. Tax officials came in third. Members of Parliament came in fourth with 54%. That's, came in third with 54%. And then judges and magistrates. And then also you have the Electoral Commission. So bear in mind, Judges and magistrates, members of parliament, tax officials, office of the president, police tops with the most perceived corrupt institution in this country. And the electoral commission also came through in that safe position. Now, fast forward to the year 2024. This is the round 10 of the Afrobarometer survey. The police tops again. 63% of the respondents, and bear in mind, in 2022, 65% of the respondents said the police was corrupt. And two years on, 63% of the respondents said police is corrupt. And guess what? The Office of the Presidency also follows again as number two most corrupt or perceived corrupt institution in this country. And then the third being tax officials. And members of parliament still remain fourth. Judges and magistrates come again in the fifth position as the most perceived corrupt institution in this country. And then the Electoral Commission. So not much has changed between 2019 and 2024 when it comes to the institutions that citizens perceive to be the most corrupt institutions in this country. Between 2022 and keep this in mind, police officers of the president, members of parliament, tax officials, and then look at this, 2022, police officers of the president, tax officials, members of parliament, judges and magistrates, same order. Now, let's have a conversation on this. Sevia Kuji is uh, the head of public affairs, in fact, he speaks for the Ghana Bar Association. Um, he's gonna be joining us on Zoom right now for a quick conversation on how, especially being one of the stakeholders in, in the judicial architecture in this country, they react to judges and magistrates continuously being ranked that fifth most perceived corrupt institution in this country. So could you appreciate your time? Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight and also on 3FM 92.7. Certainly, this ranking is not one to be proud about, is it not? Uh, I am not pleased with the report because... Um... I am not surprised, but it's just that I'm disappointed. Why is that? Because my expectation is that based on the reports we've had so far, apart from what we have uh, been announced uh, uh, yesterday or so, uh, over the weekend or so, I expected them to get out of this. But the question still remains, who corrupts them? My answer is that they don't corrupt themselves. We corrupt them. The public corrupt them. So my uh, point is this, that 
we all have to make conscious effort to make sure our institutions work. If we allow the institutions to work, uh, I'm not sure anybody will be interested in cutting corners. And I have a point that I've always made that with our current laws on bribery and corruption, I think it's a big joke that we're trying to fight corruption with such laws. The basic law says that the giver and the taker of a bribe are equally guilty. So the expectation is that a payer of bribe to a giver of bribe will go and report both the payer and the giver. But the question is, if the payer was a person of principle, would he have paid a bribe in the first place? If that is, if the point is that because he wasn't principled, that's why he's paid, they never expect him to go and report. So I think that we have to get back to our basics by way of principles and uh, moral, and uh, we'll make progress. Because it appears nobody's question, questioning the source of wealth of anybody in this country. That is why, uh, for instance, last week we had a very young person going to jail just because he wanted to be rich overnight. I see. But I can understand the route that you take in, in yes, you are disappointed with this outcome. You're not necessarily questioning the, the concerns that people have with about the judiciary or the magistrates and, and then also the, the judges for that matter. But then again, the bigger issue here is that if people continuously are losing confidence in the magistrates and judges, as has been seen continuously in this Afrobarometer survey, then they will resort to other means of getting justice. That's where the concern is, Mr. Koji. It does, because I am baffled because what I know is that one of the requirements of becoming a judge, for instance, is to be of high uh, moral integrity. Now, what it means is that nobody will have to come and tell you what to do as a judge, for instance. You have to live up to expectation. So I think that is the individual who will have to do all this. Because at that age, why should anybody tell you not to take bribe? I keep saying that as a judge, for instance, you have a contract of employment. That spells out your conditions of service. The only thing you should be expecting is improving your conditions of service and nothing else. So I don't think that those positions are just for anybody. If you know you are not a person of integrity, do it, just don't go there. Because I'm expecting a situation where people approach judges and they will call the police in. But it appears that is not happening. And it will not happen too because of the laws we have. I see. But from where you sit, and, and Ghana Bar Association being a major stakeholder in the judicial architecture in this country, with the details of this survey and the continuous perception that people have about the, the magistrates and others being corrupt, what should be done to address this, this perception and then also those experiences of reality that these people have had? I think that you have to come to the realization that if the whole of society even sees that Wealth is only calculated or, or uh, considered in terms of material gains. There should be one group of people who will say that for us, our wealth is our honesty and integrity. I expect that out of them and nothing else. So we, as a larger society, we have to begin to reward people who have integrity and are honest. I think that's the only way we can fight this battle. But no amount of guidelines, no amount of ethical uh, rules that we put in place will fight this unless individuals are committed to uphold their integrity along the lines of values and principles. Other than that, we are joking. We are simply not committed to fighting corruption. Corruption is now gradually getting institutionalized in Ghana. Let's accept it. It appears it's even in our genes. If you acknowledge that that's, that's a challenge, yes, there's that lack of commitment as you have, I mean, Ghana Bar Association are talking, a lack of commitment to fight against corruption. The next concern will be that after acknowledging that there has to be some more effort, what has to be done? That's where the concern, and I'm going to leave you on this, what has to be done, Mr. Koji? 
I cannot. That is why we have to make efforts to change the law. Why are we able or were we able to make laws to mine in forest reserves? Yet we cannot change this law on bribery and corruption and say that only the taker is guilty. I tell you, if we do it that way, we'll make progress. If you like, let's try it. Okay. We were able to change a situation of uh, where people shouldn't go into forest reserves. Even right. our great grandfathers who did, were not letted were able to preserve forests. And we, those who have been to school and have learned about these things, are not able to do it. I, I don't know what is wrong with us. So let's change the law on bribery and corruption and say that only the taker will be guilty and see if this will not stop. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, you, you recommend the amendment of the laws to make only the taker guilty. And, and in your view, that's also going to help in the fight against corruption in this country. Appreciate your time. Uh, Xavier Koji is a private legal practitioner. He speaks for the Ghana Bar Association talking about this Afrobarometer survey. We did the, the comparative analysis between what's captured in the Afrobarometer Round 9, which was also surveyed between 2019 and 2022, and then the Round 10, which was released on last Friday, which captured the, the views and concerns of people between 2022 and 2024. And look, the first five institutions perceived to be corrupt hasn't changed over the period. But coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, as the as a struggle for parliamentary majority continues following the declaration of uh, the four seats vacant by right honorable speaker of parliament about sumana case for bargaining many are calling on president kofado to intervene to bring truths to the house is this a worthy call and we seek expert analysis and, and views on this matter but there's some latest coming through um, on this particular issue, which we're going to be getting into shortly. But uh, the f former majority leader and MP for the Swami constituency, Osei Mensa Sabonsu, we're going to hear from him shortly. Um, when my colleague Evelyn Tema spoke to him, he's indicated that the speaker was right in adjourning the House a little over almost a week ago, that's last week, Tuesday. But then again, he was expecting something more. Take a look. The petition that came from Haruna, uh, I understand, was lodged with the speaker. Now, by our standing orders, if a petition is lodged, the member shepherding the petition will be given space to articulate or give vent to the petition. He gives it to the speaker. And the speaker, on account of that, will provide space to that member to articulate the content of the petition. Thereafter, the speaker then uh, refers the petition to the petitions committee to study and report to parliament. After the report is submitted, then the house could uh, discuss it, interrogate it, or debate it, and swim from which if it becomes necessary and the speaker has to give a, a ruling, perhaps that could be done, or a directive that could be done. It's not being ventilated on the floor of the House. He commended the speaker for adjourning the House on the day. We saw uh, some pedestrianism creeping into Parliament. And so what he did, cured the mischief of the House, degenerating into something else. So on that score, and I also looked at his countenance. Uh, I, I agreed with the adjournment. I thought that the adjournment was going to be perhaps for the day. And then maybe invite the leadership to further discuss the way forward. That's uh, such a mess of also there. But there's some latest coming through, a developing story right now, fresh on the plate here on Ghana tonight. Lawyers of the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Alban Sumana Kinsvo Bagbin, have filed processes at the Supreme Court seeking to set aside the Supreme Court's orders, which suspended the execution of the Speaker's ruling, declaring those four seats vacant. My colleague Dennis Paberi Wadam Esquire has been looking through the documents that we have right now here on Ghana I came through not too long ago. What are the Speaker's lawyers saying? Well, so. The uh, speaker is in court through his lawyers and he's seeking to 
if you like, overturned that particular order from the Supreme Court, which suspended his ruling that um, vacated those four MPs. So the prayer of the speaker is pretty simple, that he mm -hmm. wants that the, uh, the order of the Supreme Court be set aside and that the processes and the proceedings in the Supreme Court in this suit be set aside. He also wants that the order be vacated. And this order is in respect of the order that was dated 18th of October 2024. You remember this order that was made by the Supreme Court to the effect that the, the ruling of the Speaker, which uh, vacated the four seats in Parliament, be suspended. Mm -hmm. The order that the MPs, the, four, the said four MPs be recognized. So those are the orders that the Speaker is um, asking the Supreme Court to set aside. Now, what are the grounds? The speaker is simply saying that, that by the rate which the plaintiff had purportedly invoked the court's original jurisdiction as incompetent, mm. he makes the argument that the process or the procedure by which the plaintiff, in this case, Afenio Makin, came right. to court was not proper and to that extent is incompetent. He also says that the court had no jurisdiction to entertain the, the matter before it because he argues that this is entirely a question as to the the election of an MP or as to whether the seat is vacant or not, he contends that this is for the High Court to do. Mm -hmm. And that if the High Court, in doing so, comes to a point where they think there's the need for interpretation, at that point they could refer the matter to the Supreme Court. But as it was in the case, he makes the argument that the Supreme Court did not have jurisdiction to even entertain the matter in the first place. He also continues by saying that the court has no jurisdiction to stay execution of a ruling of the Speaker of the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. On this call, he makes the argument about separation of powers to say that even though the Supreme Court has the power to, to stay execution of rulings, that does not extend to such rulings that have been made by a Speaker of Parliament. Mm. And that the Constitution clearly defines the kind of orders that the Supreme Court can stay execution on. He makes the case that this is not one of those. For that reason, the Supreme Court does not have the, the, the jurisdiction to stay the execution of that. He also makes the case that the processes and proceedings in the suit, the suit were filed and prosecuted in breach of the rules of natural justice. We all know that this was an ex parte motion. What it means is that Afenio Makin went to court without recourse to the speaker. He was granted that particular relief. It, the argument made here is that they ought to have been heard. Mm. Then I there's see. also the other ground, that the orders of the courts dated 18th of October were made in breach of the, we've seen this already, and that the orders dated 18th of October were made in breach of the rules of, um, the rules of law and procedure mm -hmm. which regulates the court's proceedings and orders. This, when you look at the larger extent of the explanation given here, yes. it, makes process, it makes reference to how even the speaker ought to have been served. Right. It makes references to the, the, the immunity that members of parliament and the speaker have in respect of Article 117 and 118, mm. as well as an agreement that had been reached between the chief, the judicial um, service, essentially the chief justice, the chief really? justice, and then and, the speaker the of speaker. parliament, where they agreed that members of parliament should be served only on Mondays. Mm. There's a document to that effect that we have seen that That's in right. fact the speaker had, as of 18th of October, had written back to the registrar of the Supreme Court to reject service of the rate that was served on him. Mm. So basically, the speaker is seeking to set aside this particular order, which um, sought to suspend the ruling that the speaker made on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the matter that relates to the seats of the four MPs who are now um, deemed to have vacated their seats. So essentially, the speaker is questioning the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in entertaining a Fenimarkin suit? Yes. They shouldn't have even paid attention. They shouldn't to have entertained in the first place. It's even questioning the process itself to say that, look, the rate that the rate that came before you was incompetent for you to have entertained it because the rules of court have a specific a specific way by which it should come. It makes the argument that this particular rate did not follow that particular procedure. So in the first place, it ought not to have been entertained. And finally, in concluding this, mm. there was something interesting that the lawyers of the speaker said that ordinarily with this kind of process, they could have come ex parte. Right. But they, they, they think that, no, they don't want to do ex parte. Yeah. The parties involved should be served. They should be ordered to come to court for the hearing. And he has yeah. gone ahead to issue uh, hearing notices. What it means is that Wednesday, come Wednesday, this matter will be heard. You mean the As, day after tomorrow? The day after tomorrow. This matter is we'll going to be We'll see whether heard. the Supreme Court will set aside the order or to vacate its orders or not.
the coming days are going to be interesting. It's very interesting indeed. And, and as simple as you put it, and clear and understanding, Dennis Barberi with them there. We're going to be having some two uh, persons um, join us for this conversation. But uh, Jose Usu, who is the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, has also been speaking about this. And let's hear him briefly. I'll be joined by my two guests right now. Take a look. It's a reflection of the politics of today, of the things that we place emphasis on, of things that, in my view, should be in the background, mm. of things that do not add any value to our work as MPs. I'm, 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 I'm disappointed. Mm. I think that those are not the things that should take the front stage when we're discussing Parliament. Mm. And you're disappointed as in it doesn't matter who is on the majority side and who is not? It does. It does. But why are we um, behaving as we're doing when in the past, in the previous three parliaments I've been in, such matters are discussed in, indoors, at the leadership level. Mm. How is now playing out in the open? Who is whipping members to be agitated and showing off their machoism? What, will that, what, what value does that serve? What or who could be responsible for that? I'm not interested in what or who. It is reflecting badly on Parliament. Mm. What we should do. Is, as for having controversy, it has always been with Parliament. The reason Parliament is called Parliament because it's a reflection of the various shades of ideas mm. in the country. And it is expected, it is natural, that members of Parliament will often disagree. Is what we see today uh, a failure on leadership or of leadership? Well, I do not intend to make any value judgment on leadership, but for me, we are moving away from the values of parliament, how parliament had run over the years. Um, we are demonstrating the worst part of us. Even in the past, there have always been significant differences between the minority and the majority. It is this time that we have almost, almost equal members. Well, let's bring in two people on, on this. Now, Dr. Rashid Draman, Executive Director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Martin Pebu is a private legal practitioner, so he's going to be joining us in a bit. Dr. Ashid Raman, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening. So th that's the latest right now with this uh, standoff we have in Parliament. The Speaker has written back to the Supreme Court questioning essentially its jurisdiction and even entertaining this suit by Afenio Markin. And in the next two days, it's just the next 48 hours to watch. Again, is it not? Yes, indeed, Alfred. And um, if <laughs> if care is not taken, uh, this is the running battle that we are going to see between now and the end of the eighth parliament, where you know legal issues after legal issues would define the last chapter of this eighth parliament which is quite unfortunate. And uh, I just heard the uh, right honorable Joe was to the first deputy speaker. And I mean, that is a view that I share. And I think that I've said this several times on your network, that this matter is not a legal matter that the reason why we have the 275 people representing us is for them to go and sit down and talk. And that, <laughs> I mean, there will be many times when things are difficult. And when things are difficult, that's when they have to show leadership. And, but what we see these days is the least kind of uh, difficulty. Then people run to the court for uh, interpretation and you know like i said before what this does is that it only weakens 
the hand of parliament, which is already the weakest link in our democratic arrangement. The executive, as we know, is so powerful. I mean, everybody's calling for a review of the constitution to reduce the powers of the executive. Uh, now we are seeing a judiciary that is also very powerful. I mean, if you, if what we are hearing from the right honorable speaker uh, right now, all the documents that you read that are before the court, questioning, you know, why the Supreme Court is getting involved in this when it doesn't lie in the bosom of the court. I mean, it's uh, for another level. And so, Alfred, when I sit down and think about all these, apart from, you know, the fact that I repeat what I have said several times, mm. this matter requires a political solution. A political solution that that must be initiated by who? There's been proposals that the president should step into this matter to, to call both the speaker and the chief justice, or in fact, the MPP and the NDC caucus leadership? When, what approach, what route should this intervention take? In what form, essentially? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the speaker, the chief justice, the president, I think need to have a conversation, maybe at the first instance, and then eventually involving the leadership of the two parties. Um, you know, we can run away from this for as long as we want. Um, you know, if this political solution is not found, we are going to end up with a situation where no work can be done in parliament before December 7. And I think I repeat this because, you know, if we want to use the the legal approach after one failed suit another is going to emerge and we are going to see an octopus of suits if i can put it that way that now becomes something that the courts cannot handle um, and alfred the more i think about our constitutional arrangement and the separation of powers, which the right honorable speaker made reference to, the more I ask myself a lot of questions. You know, in the democratic architecture that we have, mm. the courts have powers to declare what the executive or the legislature does unconstitutional. Um, the president or the executive has the power to veto or to uh, refuse um, with reasons what comes from parliament, mostly if bills are passed. Um, parliament can impeach the president or censure his ministers or impeach them. And so we saw an attempt recently on the former finance minister. But Alfred, the fundamental question is who checks the courts? who checks the courts. And we cannot assume that the courts are perfect. We cannot assume that they are human beings. Um, so that when we say whatever the Supreme Court says is final, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a matter of law, but I, as, as a student of politics, I'm just scratching my head and asking myself these questions. Mm -hmm. So how about when the court, when the Supreme Court is wrong? Hmm. How about when the, the, well, when the High Court is wrong uh, and, you know, it passes judgment that maybe is, is not challenged and nobody takes it up maybe to the Supreme Court. I mean, we can't, we can't assume that these people are infallible. So I think there is, there is some, um, maybe the lawyers might have to think about this. Right. But for me, I, I get I get quite quite worried. 
And I think the worry is not very much on the side of the courts. The worry is very much on the side of our parliamentarians. I see. Um, well, uh, and it's at the point that you, you call in the, the lawyers and to answer that question that you asked. So I'm, I'm going to welcome Martin Pebo right now. He's joining us. Uh, he's a private legal practitioner on the foremost human rights lawyers we have in this country. Lawyer Martin Pebo, good evening. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. I can't see. Yeah. Well, so the latest, and I'm sure you've seen all the court documents right now. The Speaker of Parliament's lawyers have filed the processes urging the Supreme Court to set aside um, its orders, which stopped the declaration of the four seats uh, being vacant from coming into force. Essentially, the lawyers of the, of, of the Speaker questioning the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and even entertaining this matter. This is one that you, you predicted, I, I recall. Yes, yes, that normally uh, the right thing to do in these circumstances would be to go back to the court, uh, to ask the court to set aside the orders. Except right now, the other side to consider is that, is the court willing to eat humble pie? That's a great question to be answered. Is the Supreme Court willing to eat humble pie. Because so I can say I tell you, um, applying to the court is one thing. The court admitting that it was an error is a different kettle of fish. So that's that one that we I mean nobody can say with certainty. Unless of course they themselves seeing the turmoil they've thrown the country into, they think that okay they will put their egos aside and do the needful fine. But often in Ghana, it's not something that's easy to do. You remember how when the Kufuadu threw out into this economic uh, creator, we called and called upon him to admit and accept responsibility. You see, it never came. They rather kept blaming Russia and Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine. Then everybody got tired after we had all shouted ourselves hoarse. Then one day, in a very lame and banal manner, he said he will accept responsibility after the horses had bolted. So that's the key thing. Because, Mr. Council, let me tell you, in, mm -hmm. in, in the law, using the Constitution and the Supreme Court decisions of Ghana and other countries, there is equal opportunity to eat humble pie as the race to double down or dig in their heels. Yes. As for the law, that's the way it is. Depending on which perspective you are coming from, right. you will get sufficient uh, language and other cases to back you. So my point is that we can't say with certainty, except maybe perhaps with the consultations that Bagbin said they were being behind the scenes. Maybe if they reach an agreement that, okay, yes, uh, right just go back to the court and things will be made easier, sure. But trust me, it's a big hurdle for the court mm. to eat humble pie like this, especially in the manner in which the court has embarrassed the nation with all the turmoil. But it will be the right thing for them to do because once they've caused so much havoc, right. they should be ready to pay the price. Well, we'll see. In the next... 48 hours. In fact, the court is set to hear this matter on Wednesday. Right? So we we'll, we'll, we'll definitely will be connecting again. Uh, Martin Pueblo, appreciate your time. Thank you so much, counsel. Also to you, uh, Dr. Rashid Draman, thank you so much for talking to us on this matter. We'll wait to see how the next 48 hours will look like. Uh, Dr. Rashid Draman, executive director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Also, Martin Pueblo is private legal practitioner joining us. We're back shortly after this break on Ghana tonight, also live on 3FM 92.7. Welcome back. It's Ghana tonight. The Ministry of Interior has imposed a curfew on Boko in the Upper East region, effective today, uh, October 28th, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. daily, following renewed and deadly clashes in the area, has claimed over 10 lives, and some have quoted 15 and so on. We're keeping an eye on that fluidity of the situation there. But there was an emergency meeting of the National Security Council earlier today, chaired by the president himself, President Adolfo Kofuado, um, in response to the escalating violence.
tied to long-standing chieftaincy dispute. I'm going to put on the screen right now the excerpts of the statement that was issued after this meeting, following an emergency national security meeting held today. The un under the chairmanship of President Kufuado, he wishes to inform the general public of the following: the return to Boko on the 25th, 24th of October, 2024, Mr. Seidu Abagre who was illegally enskinned as Boko Naba in February 2023, subsequent to the vacation by the Court of Appeal, sitting in Kumasi of the warrant for his arrest, has led to significant disturbances affecting public peace and security in the area. Unfortunately, these disturbances have resulted in the loss of numerous lives in Boko and its environs, with a looming threat of escalation beyond Boko. Based on assessment by national security agencies, the continuous presence of Mr. Seidu Abagri in Boko poses a substantial threat to public safety and security in light of the foregoing, pursuant to the provisions of the Public Order Act 1994-491. A curfew is hereby imposed on Boko from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And it talks about government's commitment. Dr. Adam Bonan. Piers, that based is joining us right now. He's a, a security analyst and, and an expert in this area. Of security. They they know the problem there about as you have identified being the presence of this man. But yet the statement does not talk about what they're going to do about his presence there. Does that strike you as well? Oh yes, Africa. Good evening. I mean, what I can say is that the leadership of this country seems to be lamenting just like any of, any of us who don't have power. Because if you read the uh, statement, it is empty, it is hollow. It contains nothing apart from the curfew. Because they are telling us, you see, this statement would further worsen the situation in Boko. Because they are recounting what in their own opinion is, is you know, is created this round of uh, violence in Boko. They didn't need to tell us whether he was illegally or legally enskinned of a sort. They didn't need to tell us. All they need to do is to let us know what they are doing. And so if you read the one-page statement, there's nothing in there apart from the curfew. And we are aware of curfew in, in you know, different parts of the country when these things happen, you impose a curfew. The lazy man approach in dealing with situations like this. And so mine is that I'm not too sure why the executive leadership of this country seems to be lamenting. Instead of tackling, ensuring that probably the feuding parties, they bring them to a round table, see, I mean, have we, I know there has been effort to attempt for a dialogue that hasn't taken, I mean, that stopped or stalled some time ago. And so if the, the court in, is it a, uh, where Tamale or somewhere, you know, uh, rescinded the, the, the warrant. My point is that why can't we tell the feuding parties to go to courts if you disagree on whatever is taking place? Maybe that would, for me, why can't we put in pragmatic measures in ensuring that this whole thing probably comes down? But if you read the content of the, uh, uh, the statement coming from government, for mm -hmm. me, Alfred, it is very, very hollow. It contains nothing apart from worsening an already bad situation. Uh, you know, whilst people are dying, whilst people are dying, government is in Accra lamenting, just like any of us who have no power. That's what I can say, Alfred. Dr. Bona, and you're echoing the sentiments of many others, and I do appreciate your time on this matter. Thank you so much. Dr. Adam Bona is a security expert joining us here on Ghana tonight. We were also live on 3 FM. 92.7 so beginning today until the next foreseeable future 3fm 92.7 you can listen to us Ghana tonight as well and also on tv3 Ghana on facebook and uh, dsv channel 279 all across the world on 3news.com on behalf of the rest of the team thank you for your company we're back tomorrow for another conversation i'm alfred kansi have a good night